as you see in the the post, we'll take your questions in line uh, below the video. <coughs> Excuse me. And I guess while we wait for some of those to start rolling in, wanted to talk a little bit about how we do stuff here at PG, particularly relating to gear reviews, since um, we have a pretty heavy gear focus here. And um, I thought maybe it would be cool to just sort of uh, walk you through how we decide what to review, because. I know just as a pretty skeptical uh, person in general, I, uh, these days you kind of have to be, right? Have to be <laughs> street smart or, or, you know, have a heavy dose of cynicism out about the world. But I know just from my own regular viewpoint and from what I see, you know, in comments and emails that we get here and stuff I see on forums like the gear page and stuff like that, that there's a decent amount of uh, heavy, heavy skepticism about how things are run at just magazines in general, and I, I can't blame anyone for thinking of that. But so I know probably everyone likes to claim that they do things different. At, at PG, we really do do things differently uh, from what you kind of see in a lot of consumer mags that, that review gear and stuff. So I'll let you. <clears throat> pull back, I'll pull back the, the curtain from the process a little bit. So basically every week uh, we have a little committee here at PG that consists of uh, our gear editor, Charles Softley, um, our base gear guru, Rich Osweiler, and Jason Shadrick, and me. We basically, basically meet every week and we have <clears throat> a couple of ways that we ask people to reach out to us to, if they want their gear reviewed. We have a form on our website that they can go and fill in all the pertinent information, price, upload pics, uh, press release with all the details and all that. Submit it to us or they can just email us directly and uh, email Charles softly and Rich, not me. But, I mean, you can see me ask. Uh, anyway. People in inquire on that form or via email, and uh, every week, Charles, Rich, Jason, and I get together, go over those inquiries, and basically, um, we kind of approach it the same way we do artist features. It's just, I mean, for, for the artist features, it's a different group. Uh, we don't want to occupy everyone's time with um, meetings, but it's a different group of editors for features meeting. But in both meetings, basically, we take a look at what is new right then. With, with gear reviews and features, we don't want to, for the most part, we want to cover stuff that's new and newsworthy because, so, you know, you, most of you guys out there are pretty up to date about what's new on the gear front. And so we want to show you guys what's new first. <clears throat> so basically, in both those meetings, we'll go listen either to the artists or to the gear. You know, manufacturers usually send us links to YouTube videos. Um, we look at the specs, uh, and basically we look at it in a really big picture way. Um, we're always trying to have a diverse lineup in the print version and online, and <clears throat> we don't want to have like, you know, three dual humbucker guitars in one issue or online at the same time. Or we don't want to have a bunch of overdrives in the same issue or the same style of amp. So um, <clears throat> for this crew that handles both features and gear reviews, it's, it's pretty tricky. It's a lot trickier than you guys would think juggling because we want to make sure it's just this great smorgasbord of, of gear and artist features coming up. So we'll look at all that stuff. We're like, oh, we really recently reviewed a fuzz like this. So. <clears throat> Maybe we're going to hold off for a while. Maybe we won't review this fuzz this time. Or, or maybe we reviewed something from those guys just like two months ago. And since there are like thousands of manufacturers out there, we're going to have to say no thanks this time and tell them to keep in touch with us with their next new product. And so that's kind of how it goes. I mean, it's very democratic, actually. The people on the gear review team, we just basically vote. Like, yeah, I think that... That should be in the lineup based on all these criteria that I've mentioned before. Um, so other criteria that we 
that come into play are price. We try to have a good range from entry level stuff to then, you know, nice boutique stuff too, not too pricey usually. Um, we're trying to have something in there for everybody. So that's kind of how it goes. I, I, I think, I guess the reason why I want this up is because back to that skepticism that is very healthy, and I would not encourage you to lose that. I would encourage everyone to have that. Uh, and I, but I worked at uh, a number of publications in the past, and <clears throat> and I'm aware of others that, you know, uh, various places these days, it, it, uh, it's so competitive with, in terms of, you know, publications like Premier Guitar are supported by ad dollars primarily. Um, and you know, you guys, if you if you are paying for the print magazine or whatever, that's awesome. We appreciate that and hope more of you do that. We do have a print magazine for those of you who just know us from Rig Rundowns and all that. We have a great print magazine. I have a, when I get your questions in a minute, I have art director Megan Malumbi for PG, her, our illustrious overseer of all things aesthetic, visually aesthetic <laughs> over here is going to read me some of your questions. Megan, can you just toss me like the latest magazine? It's right under my keyboard over there. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so this is our latest issue. Uh, well, it's actually not our latest. This is we haven't gotten the latest one from the printer. It should be here maybe tomorrow. This is our August issue, seven sleeper amps or sleeper vintage amps, seven unknowns you should own. Anyway, pick it up. But for those of you who pay for a print sub, that's cool. We appreciate it. But uh, just so you know, pretty much no print magazines out there make a whole lot of money off of subs. So that's why you see ads. But. <laughs> But, Megan's laughing at me. <laughs> the thing is, you know, there's, people perceive a lot of pressure to cover stuff. And I, from comments I've read on forums and stuff, people think that basically we just review whatever advertisers pay us to review. We, there's nothing like that. We don't, we don't check Charlie, Rich, and Jason and I when we go over the inquiries for reviews, we don't go, oh, I wonder if these guys are advertising because we should scratch their back. Of course, we re really appreciate our sponsors who support us with ads, but uh, they, we, we know and we expect that they know that the reason they wanted to put their money into PG is because of our credibility. And I think if you read our reviews, you'll see a depth there and an honesty there that... Uh, you don't see that often in consumer magazines, and uh, we're, you know if something seems like it could be better in a certain way, we're going to say it. We're not going to be jerks about it and say this thing's a piece of shit because this little thing needs to be better. But we're, we're I'm really proud of how honest we are, and uh, a lot of people seem to think, well, they just pull punches. I think. A lot of people out there group us, just throw all magazines together and just be like, eh, everything is corrupted these days and, and you can't trust anyone. But we really do go above and beyond to show you guys cool gear, talk honestly about what's cool about it and ways it could be improved. And, and you know, I, I guess this brings up another question. And then I'll get to your questions, but another thing that comes up is a lot of times people are like, you guys never give a shitty review to anyone. And it's not true. If you go and look at our, just go to our gear reviews landing page on premierguitar.com and look at all the reviews. There are scores all over the place. But the other thing is, I mean, sure there's junk out there these days. You know, if you go to maybe your local mom pop piano store might have some pretty bad guitars on the wall. We don't choose to review stuff like, we want to bring you guys information about gear that's cool, not purposely single out something that like, that's probably sucky, so let's get that so that we can look like we're badass and really crap all over it. So we're trying to walk that tightrope of show a variety of gear, talk about a variety of gear, let you hear it, talk honestly about it. And, but but the truth is, in the, ter in the realm of serious gear ranging from really entry-level stuff, Squire stuff, for example, from Fender or Epiphone or 
whatever, on up to the boutique stuff. It's shocking how great things have gotten, you know, since I started beginning uh, to play guitar back in the 80s. Um, I mean, for example, right in my office right here, I have two Squire guitars that I love. I swap out the pickups, sure. But uh, if, if anyone had told me back in the 80s that I would own, I think I'm up to three Squires now, with all the different pickups in them and stuff, but I would have laughed in their face because there was obviously a time before uh, CNC construction that, <laughs> that those guitar brands maybe weren't as great as they are now. But uh, the truth is there isn't that much shit out there, <laughs> pardon my language. That's why you skeptics who uh, will be like, why don't they trash stuff more? That's why you're not seeing it that much. Uh, to, to me, for the most part, I mean, there have been a few isolated incidents of things that were so bad that we're like, we're just, after we get it in, we're like, forget it, we're not reviewing that. Is That thing clearly is not even ready for market. And most of those incidents, uh, those products were sort of quietly removed from market because uh, the companies kind of realized what we realized. But um, the other thing is just really the reason, what I find today, although there's certainly issues here and there, is that it really is just what you, the target audience, like I might play a guitar that isn't fit for my style, but just because, you know, back, for example, back in the 80s, I was total shred head, still like some of that stuff, but, you know, my first guitar was an 83 Strat, I said, over a, the course of like a year after I got that, I started reading guitar mags a lot more, and realized like, oh, I, I have to have a Floyd Rose and a humbucker, because I was so into Van Halen and living color and stuff like that, and... But I'm not a pointy headstock guitar these days. I'm not a pointy headstock guy these days. But just because I get in a guitar of that style now and play, and it's not for my style of music. I mean, I play Jazz Masters. This is my baritone Jazz Master with a Bournemouth neck. It's Squire body, Curtis Novak pickups. Squire over there. Just because something doesn't meet my style, which you can kind of intuit what my style is based on that stuff, doesn't mean that it's a crappy guitar. So, anyway, I'll stop blabbing on that. Uh, hopefully there are a few questions here I can take. Megan? <laughs> um, they're a little less gear related, a little, uh, That's cool. no a little lighter. Um, Marky Mark would like to know if you still visit Utah. Timely. The real Marky Mark? Uh, <laughs> you know what? We'll just leave that up for interpretation. I do still visit Utah. Usually about once a year. I wish I, that I could get there more because all, pretty much all of my family, all of my wife's family are there. Um, uh, I, I will actually be going there here in about a week for a wedding. But yeah, it's been, how long, it's been a little over a year since I was there. So... I, I love Salt Lake City. I love Utah. I love the, uh, there's super awesome, like, a lot of amazing state and national parks there, of course, Zions and Arches, and uh, Salt Lake City is a really cool city, too. I miss that. Uh, let's see. Ooh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 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 ben Ruby would like to ask, would you rather, are you ready for this? Yeah. Start Can here? I don't know, maybe. Would you rather start a prog rock slash salsa slash Mongolian throat singing band with one John Bollinger sized duck or with 1,000 duck sized John Bollingers? <laughs> oh my god. Wow. Uh, <laughs> why not? It's a, Monday morning. Why not a super group with all uh, that? Yeah. Oh, wow. God, wow, I can't even, okay, a Mongolian prog, a Mongolian throat singing prog band with one duck sized John Bollinger or a thousand John, John Bollinger, Bollinger sized, sized ducks. ducks. What's the difference? Well, one's 
Actually, John Bollinger and one's a thousand ducks. Oh, all right. Uh, I, I, I'd probably have side projects for both, depending on the venue. One for zoos, uh, one for the rest, I guess. All right, all right, all right. Um, I guess, can you talk a little bit more about our rig rundowns? And um, a lot of people ask, you know, hey, can you do this? Can you do this one? Do you sure. take a sure. lot of suggestions for rig rundowns from? Just kind of demystify the process of rig rundowns? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, for those of you who have been following Premier Guitar for a long time, we used to do our rig rundowns out of our headquarters here in Iowa, <clears throat> but a lot, we spent a lot of time on the road driving very late at night driving to Des Moines or Chicago or Milwaukee or Minneapolis or whatever and it got pretty draining so we decided to save ourselves some time and headaches and sleep and we moved our video team to Nashville which is where pretty much where we shoot all of the rig rundowns occasionally we'll make road trips a couple hours away and for something huge, we might fly somewhere else if it, you know, we're something really huge that we're just not going to get any other way. But because it's based in Nashville, basically, <clears throat> we're just keeping our eyes on the listings for concerts there in the Nashville vicinity. And uh, as you guys probably know, we do usually have a rig rundown for you every week, a new one. So we're really just um, looking at what's coming up in the, the coming weeks so we can have ample time to reach out to the publicists and have them reach out to the band management and all that stuff and it's a lot like the other gear review and feature stuff we want to have a diverse lineup we don't want to just excuse me do all country guitarists or prog mongolian throat singing bands or uh, we, we want to have a, a diverse array of <clears throat> styles and we want to be diverse in every way, really. So, <clears throat> but since we're the, the, since we can only do stuff in the vicinity of Nashville, then obviously that restricts us a lot. So, basically we, I meet with a, another team and we kind of do a similar process to talk about what's coming up soon, what days we have available, because, um, Another wrinkle is our video team, Perry Bean is our main videogra videographer, and Chris Keyes also does a lot of that stuff. John Bollinger, of course, he's on the road with Lee Bryce a lot, so there's schedules to deal with. Uh, so basically we meet and talk about what's coming up, what the schedules are like, what, uh, you know, what days the, the concerts are, what days need to be dedicated to recording uh, John Bollinger's and Steve Cook's really great review demo videos to show you guys how uh, review gear sounds. So it's a lot of juggling again, <clears throat> but that's pretty much the gist of it. All right. Um, let's see. We have Song Parabola is asking... Um, how about some blind A-B between a well-known artist on their rig versus an instrument versus the same artist and instrument on a digital modeling amp? Um, suppose we spent some time accurately counterfeiting. How good is equipment at actual modeling? That would, that would definitely be interesting. I, I, I'm sure that would be... Uh, if you guys couldn't hear what Megan said, she, a uh, reader basically asked if we could, if we've thought about having some artists like play the same riffs through their own rig and then a rig that emulates that, assuming that the, you know, like most guitarists tend to, that we do rig rundowns with tend to use tube amps and stuff like that. <clears throat> I think that's what, Why Song, was that his, their name? Why song? Yeah. Why song? I think that's what they were getting at, and I think that would be really intriguing. It would be fun. Um, the only, the main trick with that would be probably be just when we're filming rig rundowns. It is so 
we're so crunched for time and a lot of times we're just like we're just lucky that the road crew lets us get in and do it at all because they're like we're doing sound check in, <laughs> in five minutes so um i think it, although i think it'd be very instructive I, that might be a tough one to pull off but i i think probably given how good modelers are these days from kemper to axe effects and and the others I, I'm guessing that you would probably hear, a lot of us would hear kind of the same thing or pretty close to the same. Maybe the player would notice more of a difference in the responsiveness between the two because that's something that we often hear players of who decide to stick with tube gear versus modelers, they tend to talk about the feel of it more. But it's an intriguing idea. Thanks for putting that out there, Y Song. Uh, Parabula. If we parabula. <laughs> if we ever figure out a way to do that, we'll, we'll try to remember to give you credit. <laughs> um, we have a couple more people pleading for a Circa Survive rig rundown. Circa Survive. Um, okay. We'll keep our eyes out for that. We, I remember when it's been what, a couple of years since that album came out. Isn't that the one that has Andy Summers on it with a, like a younger singer? I, I think so. Anyway, it's early in the morning. My coffee's barely kicked in. We'll keep our eyes out for that. I remember thinking that was a cool album when we got it a year or two ago. Um, Daniel Gomez is asking, did you ever consider to create or translate any particular content for Spanish or Latin premier guitar fans worldwide? There are many inquiries. Daniel Gomez just asked, in case you guys didn't hear, if we've thought about translating our content. We have. We've, we've had a lot of conversations about that because um, we have fans all over the world, especially Rig Rundown fans. And, um, I mean, I've been, not that I, like, I'm a big globe trotter. I don't have that kind of money, but when I go to, you know, outside the country and run into guitarists, like, inevitably, they're like, Rig Rundowns? Um, so we have, we know we have a huge audience around the world and, uh, the biggest trick is the, you know, just the sheer volume of what we do. Um, and not just translating it, as you guys know, <laughs> there's so much lingo, uh, in, involved with what we do that it's, you don't just need a good translator, you have to find a kick-ass guitarist who's a good translator and that's just you know maybe someday maybe someday Google Translate will get good enough doubt it <laughs> but I mean we wish we could and who knows what will happen in the future but we have definitely thought about that for multiple different languages around the world because we know that um, there's a huge audience out there that's untapped it's really it's some complications with resources and finding the right ones we would need, not to mention just sort of the, probably the return on invest in the investment it might get is just so much. But you know, you never know. Thanks for asking, Daniel. Got any more? Uh, yes, we do have uh, another Sean is asking, Ooh, hey, Sean. Sean Herbert. <laughs> Sean Herbert. S-H-A-W-N or S-E-A-N or S-H-A-U-N? S-H-A-W-N. Damn. Yep. Hey, are artists usually cool with rig rundowns, or are some of them bothered by us asking? I would presume. Oh, like when we just inquire about it. I think it's changed quite a bit. You know, Premier Guitar got big based on doing rig rundowns years and years ago. I guess it's been nine, ten years now that we've been doing them, and uh, no one was doing anything like them back when we started. And so <clears throat> it was such a new concept that it was trickier to get people, especially since Premier Guitar was also new itself. It wasn't like we were an existing known entity that was trying to do some new thing with video. We were brand new. We were in the middle of nowhere, literally here in the Midwest. Um, so we kind of had to prove ourselves, and we did. And now, like, big name artists, a lot of them, not all of them, of course, uh, but a lot of big name artists are like asking us to do rig rundowns, like email us or if we somehow have a communication about a, another thing, about an album or whatever, they're asking us to do them. So we, there's big, big fans all over the world from 
regular everyday players like you and me to some pretty big names. It's still tough with some, you know, there are certain players out there, not a lot, but I don't know, a handful that just really, they're so high up, they're, they've been established so long that they really, they don't need the publicity. And I'm not going to name names because maybe someday those will happen, but they don't need the publicity. They're sick of doing interviews for the last 50 years of their lives. You know, they might have a new album, they're like, they tell their publicist, I'm doing one interview, and sometimes it's not even with a guitar magazine, it's like with the Guardian of London or something like that. So it's all over the map. But um, for the most part, these days there aren't that many that are like, no way. Usually it's just like, oh, they're really flattered to be asked and maybe, maybe some of the logistics don't turn out to work for us based on how much time they have backstage. Maybe they're on a Maybe they are going to Nashville, but they're on like a, <clears throat> they're doing a festival tour and those are just a nightmare. There's not really enough time between sets to set up and film anything. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, Sean, right? Sean Herbert? Yes, which he, he uh, said that's the phonetically correct way. Of <laughs> Damn right. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I think this is an important question to address, and I know we get it a lot, so um, I'm going to speak for this person, Rocky Barney. Rocky Barney. Yes. Um, hey, Rocky. Is asking, does PG get to keep the gear they review, oh, and does it's... PG feel pressure from gear manufacturers to give positive uh, reviews? I'm so glad that you asked that, Rocky. I don't know if you hit the top of the video when we started up, but I spent several minutes talking about the gear review process earlier, so maybe go back and watch the beginning to hear more of the process. Um, but I did not hit on that point, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, no, we do not keep the gear. Uh, we have a strict policy, um, in my view, and I'm sure that, uh, I don't know, I can't say how it works at other magazines. I, I, Okay, I, I know that some places that have consumer magazines that do reviews, but people do keep the gear all the time, and they consider that a, a perk of the gig. But, um, I don't know, I'm kind of a hard ass in a lot of ways, and I'm uh, when I studied journalism, uh, I still go back to my ethics class, um, it, you know, scientifically proven. If you take something for free, you're going to whether it's conscious or not, you're going to have some cognitive dissonance about saying anything negative about a product that someone is giving you. Um, so no, we, and, you know, some, most companies want their gear back because, I mean, they're in business and it's a tough market. There's so many, mar so many manufacturers these days, but some are really cool and they're like, hey, you guys can just keep it because, you know, maybe if it's something less expensive, a pedal or something, it, they might just be like, I can't sell it new now anyway, so, and by the time I pay shipping and insurance and stuff, it, um, it's not really worth it. Sometimes they'll offer to let us keep it and I don't, we'll always say, you know, thank you, <laughs> that's very cool of you to offer that for free, but no, we can't keep that. If they really don't think it's worth paying to have it shipped back, we'll send it over to our marketing department and they will set up a giveaway so that you guys can enter it for a chance to win one. So that works. Uh, about the biggest perk along that along those lines that we get in this industry uh, as either freelancers for Premier Guitar or full-time staffers for Premier Guitar is, you know, if a company will give us if I, if I say, you know, if I reach out to Fender and say, hey, can I buy something, or to any other company, I might reach out and say, hey, can I buy this directly from you? And they, you know, they give us a decent deal, you know, but it's kind of like any other industry. It's not, it, I mean, I've actually had instances where I bought pedals and the companies were like, oh, send me 
whatever, 25 bucks, and I'm like, dude, that is not how much this pedal costs to build. I have to at least pay for what it costs you to build this. I, I wouldn't feel right about it. So that's our stance, and I, I hope that that uh, gives people a little more confidence in our credibility in what we do with gear reviews. We do not keep stuff. We send it back, or the company insists on leaving it here because it doesn't cost that. It would not be worth getting back. We take it over to marketing, and there's a giveaway for it. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Um, jumping back into um, rig rundowns. Rig rundowns? Uh, yes. Um, how do you guys, or uh, Lewis Scutty is asking, how do you guys handle when you know more about an artist's gear than they do? <laughs> and I've seen a lot of artists misquote what they have or that or what something is. Okay, so just to recap, Lewis Scutty, I think, asked yep. on rig rundowns, what do we do uh, if someone doesn't know that much about their gear? And since, <clears throat> you know, I don't do a lot of, rig rundowns anymore. I haven't for a few years since we moved our video team to Nashville. So I'm not the best person to ask on this, but I, I doubt it's changed any since I did it, did rig rundowns more. Um, you just roll with it, you know? So we try to sometimes, we always try to talk to the artist because obviously that's the coolest uh, because we want to hear them play, ideally, if they have time before sound check and all that. but. It's also great to talk to the techs because they uh, often know way more about the gear. With certain players, I, don't, I kind of, I see it both ways. Like, I'm a glass half full guy uh, most of the time. <laughs> and I, I kind of sometimes admire some players who just don't really care. They just have their stuff and they plug in and it's, you know, they love their gear. You know, we haven't done a rig rundown with Tom Morello yet. Tom, if you're watching, uh, we'd love to do one someday. But, you know, he's one of those players who has played, like, the same gear for the most part for, like, 30 years. And he's an iconic player. He has his own sound. He's, he sticks to that gear, doesn't change it a lot. But at the end of the day, he's, his head and his heart are in the music. And I admire that for players who are like that. Sometimes, you know, I've been on some rig rundowns before where uh, people said something and maybe they misspoke and I said, oh, you mean this? You know, just gently correct them if you notice there's a mistake or if there's a discrepancy, ideally we'll get the extra info from, from the tech. So. All right. Um... Just a couple more questions. Couple, yeah. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Um, let's see. We had Barry Provost is asking what your favorite pickups are, if you have any, and um, type of music. Barry Provost? Yes. Asks what my favorite type of pickups are. Or type of, mu or type also of music. Also type of music. Yeah. Um, my musical tastes are all over the map. Like from classical to swing, jazz, and uh, hardcore and post-hardcore, and death metal and weird shit, um, to classic rock and pop, and it's really all over the place. Like, um, I have some music that will repulse <laughs> probably 90% of listeners, uh, but... Um, but yeah, I'm all over the place. So in terms of what I play, um, the, it's I try to lose myself into thinking. Uh, I okay, I'm joking a little bit. I think everyone, if they approach it the right way, has a unique voice in there. Of course, we all, the greatest players, and everyday people like me are influenced by what we listen to and everything we hear all day. I try. I don't really, since I was a teenager, I haven't really spent that much time learning other people's music because I prefer to write my own. That's what, that's what uh, fulfills me with guitar and music, um, trying to write my own stuff. And, and I, some, 
I'm not hardcore about this. Like, I'll, if I really love something, I might, like, figure out the riff. But it, for the most part, I kind of feel like a, I only want my influences to sort of, like, uh, mysteriously filter into what I come, on, come up with for my own music and be evident only through... Not so obviously, I guess, if that makes any sense. So I prefer to play my own tunes with um, my band and stuff. I'm sure people hear it, they'll be like, they could pick out elements of things from here and there, but anyway, in terms of pickups, I'm not sure if you, if, was it Barry? Yes. I'm not sure if Barry means like brand or, but I mean, there are so many great pickups out there, I wouldn't want to make it ever sound like there's only one company. I have, you know, in my telly, Squire telly over there, Megan, if, can you show it to me? This is a, a uh, what are they called? Classic Vibe 50s Squire telly that I traded a Strat for a five, a six, maybe seven years ago. And it, when it came here from, I think it came from Nashville, uh, found the guy on Craigslist. There's a weird, just straight across trade thing. Um, it, the box looked like it had been run over when it came here. It was not a rectangular box, it was oval. It dinged up a little bit, but it played fine. Um, I, I think the first pickups I put in this after that were, uh, I got some uh, Jim Campolongo Custom Shop Telly pickups that sounded really good in it, and then uh, right now I've got Nordstrand, I forget, I always forget, it's like AVN N3 or something like that. I reviewed them a few years ago and loved them so much that I bought them after the review. Don't, we don't talk about that stuff during the review. After the review is over and it's wrapped up, then I go, hey, can I buy these? They're really great. And I love them. They sound great. They're vintage voiced. Um, I love, I like tellies a lot. I love jazz masters. For the last few years, I've actually been on a baritone kick. My first baritone was a, just a cheap Dan Electro. Um, and a good sounding Dan Electro, don't get me wrong. Got an Eastwood side jack baritone with uh i didn't want to carve out the body that would have cost more than the guitar itself pretty much um so i got some pickups called from manlius m-a-n-l-i-u-s he makes some pickups called goat masters that are like uh jazz master style construction but they fit in a p90 housing those sound really good but Recently, my, my most favorite for baritone stuff, I, I play baritone primarily because of the whole weird thing with, um, uh, I guess since my, my listening tastes are all over the map and I only want to write my own stuff, that I guess the stuff I write is, I wouldn't say like batshit weird, batshit crazy or anything, but it, there's odd time signatures and uh, stuff. And where we live here in uh, Iowa, it's, you know, it's not podunk or anything, but it's a medium-sized city, and I found that it, it was hard to hook up with a lot of other players with a similar mindset who were also, you know, you know, how when you're trying to form a band, there's so many different aspects to it. Are they confidence, you know, are they skilled enough, or are they into the same stuff, Do, are they de dependable and responsible, are they cool and you want to hang out with them, like, can you, all that stuff, and between all those things and sort of the different music I like to play, it just got pretty, honestly, a little demoralizing trying to, like, and round them out and have them stick, and so I finally just said, you know what? I'm playing baritone guitar, won't have to, you know, be screwed by having a bassist who doesn't show up or whatever. It's obviously not a, a, a proper replacement for bass, but it, so I'm in a, a duo, me and a drummer with baritone guitar. There's lots of reverb because I'm a reverb junkie and because the reverb sort of helps fill out the space too. And it just sounds cool, I think. 
So, anyway, we're on a baritone kick. This is the guitar I've been playing a lot recently. It's the Squire. Uh, this was a Squire vintage modified jazz master that I've got a warm up neck, baritone neck for. So, 24 fret. It's a 28 and a half inch scale, I think. And the pickups I have in it are other, another set that I reviewed and loved. Excuse me, they are. Curtis Novak, they're called uh, uh, Wide Range, they're his Wide Range. They're basically uh, built like the old Wide Range humbuckers that were in the old Tele Deluxes and uh, Starcasters, but they fit into um, Jazzmaster sized routes. And they sound amazing. They sound, it still sounds like a Jazzmaster, it's got a, that single coil clarity, there's this nice texture to it. and they're humbuckers. With, um, I normally prefer single coils. Pretty much all my guitars have single coils except for one other one. And so I was kind of skeptical, but they sound great. It's, they fully keep that single coil vibe, and they're awesome. That's a long way to answer your question, but hopefully it answered it. Barry, right? Yes. Cool. Yeah. You... Any other questions, or should we wrap it? Uh, do you have time for one more? Okay, sounds good. Uh, Matt, high quality, cheap, in quotes, guitar you've come across. Oh, wow. And What's amp the highest quality, ch cheap guitar that I've come across? Yeah, and as well as. The high school. Uh, did we lose the signal? Is info connected? Are we still running? Hey guys, I think we're back. We're the clarity of the lamps, uh, not multi channel things. One channel hand wired. I'm not saying that's the only thing that sounds good, but I do splurge on amps. Um, I think that matters. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, there are a lot of great amps that are not hand wired, too. Um, so I don't know if I can really give an answer on what's the best cheap amp out there. There's so many good ones. You just got to go and play them. Uh, Vox and Fender and Marshall, all the big companies really have good stuff. You just got to try it and see if it sounds good with your guitars and your pedals and all that. So I'm not trying to wuss out on that question. I just don't know how to answer it better, uh, especially since, uh, I don't know, I guess I have kind of weird tastes. No. <laughs> not at all. Uh, okay. For today, thanks for joining us, and we'll do this again, guys.